I'm Josh Owens. Uh, I work at Differential, and uh, I'm a developer there. We do, um, I'd say, like 98% of all our client work is in Meteor right now. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, the story of what I've learned over the last year of, of using Meteor. Um, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub, links up there. I also do a Meteor podcast. It's like a 15-minute news type podcast that we put out every week, except the last two weeks I was on vacation. Uh, I also run a site called Crater.io, which is like uh, Reddit, but specifically for Meteor News. So check all that stuff out. So this is really the story of how... Um, four developers have kind of built over 40 plus apps in the last year. So um, I feel like we've been able to put together some really good kind of practices and, and packages and that kind of stuff to, to really make development easier um, and to really like cut down on how long it takes to get an app out, you know, into the wild. Um, or you could even say how we've we've built and maintained 10 open source packages in a year as well. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. So getting started fast, um, the focus for Differential when it started was a lot more uh, startup based, like come build your MVP, you know, get it done. So the goal was to try to get it done in, in five to six weeks for clients. And I would say that Meteor has kind of helped us hit that. Um, so I worked, w I've, I've done Rails work for about 10 years now. Um, so that's going to be my point of comparison throughout this talk. So I'm not like trying to, to say Rails is bad or bash it in any way. It's just like the easiest point of comparison that I have to make. Um, and I find that with Rails or, or with Ruby, like, you know, it would take eight to 10 weeks to really get something out the door for a client and then you still haven't like built kind of the front end at that point like maybe you've started and done some backbone or some angular or ember um, but it's just not really it, usually not built with that mindset out of the gate um, and so we <clears throat> we found that um, through using meteor and through the packages that we've developed we were able to cut it down to just about five weeks to really get something done and usable and in the customer's hands. So um, we've been pretty happy with that. I think the other key piece and why it works so well is the packaging system. So uh, there's a, a website, atmospherejs.com, um, and it's, it's kind of like Ruby Gems or something along those lines uh, or npmjs.org. And you can go there and just, uh, they've got a good search interface and, you know, they've got good exposure mechanisms like the trending. Um, the other interesting thing that they do is they actually track stats. So you can see, like here, this package has been downloaded 107 times. You need a little sparkline graph that shows you the last two weeks. And they're actually doing metrics on how often something's being released and um, they, when you do a search, they kind of rank things based on how much they're being downloaded or how often they're being released. So they're, they're like factoring all that into a formula. There's actually a really great post online about how they're, they're ranking everything and what they plan to do in the future. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome. I love that, uh, it's less of a question of which package you should use because they're, they're kind of bubbling the good ones to the top. Um, and then... The other great thing is that the package system just uses NPM under the covers. So you automatically get access to like the entire NPM library that's already out there. So if you need to work with GitHub or work with Twitter or, you know, we had a client uh, we were doing fantasy, uh, daily fantasy sports with and we wanted real time stats and uh, they got access to sports data API and uh, we went out and looked and there was a package already out there. So we were able to just put a little wrapper around it and push it up to Atmosphere and integrate that. And, you know, now we're pulling that every 20 seconds to get real-time game stats to, to kind of do the reactive scoring on the website. Uh, the other great thing about the packaging system is the namespacing. So by default, uh, when you're creating a package, um, 
everything is, is kind of namespaced and set aside. And you really have to think about the things that you want to expose in Meteor. And you actually have to go in and say, here's a namespace. I want to expose it to the client or I want to expose it to the server. And so you kind of have to think about that. So by default, like everything's kind of in its own namespace, so you don't have to worry about collisions. Um, there, there is still a slight problem there in that it uses something akin to an RPC mechanism between the client and server for communication. And uh, sometimes you have to be cognizant of what you name those, those server-side methods because uh, if you name it something obvious like, you know, post, then someone else might already have that, you know, in their package or in their app itself. So um, that, that piece is not namespaced. And I don't, I don't know that they ever will, so. <clears throat> the other great thing about Meteor, obviously, like, being here, this is a, a huge meetup. Um, it's just JavaScript. Like, it's still the number one language on GitHub. Um, you know, like, like, Ruby has a strong showing in this graph. I think this graph's, like, a year old. Um, but if, if you actually look at the top and the bottom, JavaScript and CoffeeScript are both on here. Um, and, you know, those are, those are both JavaScript based. And so there, there's really interesting things that happen when you're just in JavaScript land. So um, it becomes easier to hire people because there's a tendency for most people, uh, if you're a designer, you start to trend towards using JavaScript because you need to build like maybe a more reactive interface. Uh, and on the back end, you kind of have the same tendencies for people to migrate towards kind of the front end JavaScript work as well. Um, so I think it makes finding people and hiring people a little easier because it's all JavaScript based. And the other interesting thing is that, like in particular with our designer, um, the very first differential project was done in Rails. And he had a lot of trouble learning that and picking that up. And when we made the switch to Meteor, um, he actually just took to it naturally. It seemed really easy for him. Um, he asked us a lot less questions. He tends to take care of things on his own. Uh, he actually maintains, we have a boilerplate for getting started with new apps, and he's actually the one that maintains like keeping that up to date and, and making sure that it's, it's uh, working the way we want. Uh, so generally, like when we start a new project, he'll go in and fork the boilerplate, and he'll put the design in place and then turn it over to a developer to kind of make it function the way that it should in the back end. Uh, but he's able to do quite a bit of front end work without us ever getting involved. So it's been kind of nice. Uh, <clears throat> so the great thing about Meteor is the fact that it's reactive by default. Um, it's not your typical um, server side framework in that you hit a link, the server renders some HTML, pushes that down to a browser. Um, and then, you know, you click another link and server renders some HTML and pushes it down to the browser. This is more, you push a little bit of HTML down to the browser with enough JavaScript in place to kind of bootstrap the environment. And then there's DDP uh, happening. It's, uh, it's their own protocol, and they're trying to get it IEEE certified. Um, but that handles all the communication back and forth between the client and server. So it's like a pub-sub mechanism. And it makes it very, very easy to automatically get your page updated. So like, for instance, when we were doing Fantasy Hub, uh, we would calculate, you know, we'd grab the, the data from the API, calculate some scores, shove that into Mongo on the server, and the client had a subscription, and it would just get fed the update, and the page would update. And we didn't have to do anything to make that work. It was just all automatic. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. Uh, it definitely seems like a better way to go in the future. Um, it seems like if the data is updating in the database, in this day and age, in 2014, like we should see that happen. You know, Twitter and Facebook are, are kind of pushing those kinds of things forward for us and, it, and making clients and customers kind of expect that from us. Um, <clears throat> and so Meteor. Uh, I think it's, it's actually more than a framework at this point. So, you know, they're doing things like pushing the DDP protocol forward and, 
you know, they've got their build tool now that's, uh, I guess it's probably akin to Grunt. So it's, it's building everything and packaging it up for the, the browser. Um, and then they have, you know, the node stuff on the back end. And when you start to combine all that, you start to get this, this almost, it's a real-time platform at this point. It's not really like a, a, a framework anymore. So the interesting thing that happens when you start doing that is, you know, you get things like the build tool is now getting integration with Cordova. So you'll be able to say Meteor build iOS, and it'll just spit out an iOS native app using Cordova for you. So uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things that can happen here that uh, we're just starting to learn about. The, uh, the community has actually been really amazing to um, participate in and watch grow. In particular, like this is a picture of DevShop. They do this once a month uh, at the Meteor Development Group's headquarters. Um, maybe this is something that happens because you know they took $11 million in funding, and so you don't see this with other frameworks. But you know they, they open their doors a couple hours early. People can come in, sit around, hack together on projects, ask questions. They make some of the development group available to help people out. They ask other kind of experts to come out and help people as well, try to increase adoption. And then they bring in dinner, and then they do two 30-minute talks, and they do you know five or six five-minute lightning talks. And the great part is, like me being here in Cincinnati, I can actually tune in you know, the last Thursday of every month at 10 p.m., and it's streamed over YouTube. So I can actually kind of participate. And then they take questions from the audience, <laughs> and they take questions from... Uh, people on Twitter or YouTube as well. So it's been really fun uh, to participate in this kind of stuff. And then they also s um, save the videos and then publish those on YouTube later as well. So there's already like a great collection of learning material out there uh, because of the, the community. And then, you know, doing things like putting Crater up and, and watching everyone just kind of come along and participate and sharing the news that of all the things that they're working on. and. I don't, this is probably the same in most other communities, but you know, open source, like running 10 projects, we're just seeing great participation and pull requests and issues and that kind of thing. So um, just found it to be a really open and welcoming community uh, so far anyway. We haven't had any Ruby dramas. <coughs> this, is, um, this is where my, my journey started. Um, this screenshot here, I subscribed to Railscast Pro, and Ryan Bates did a series of comparisons between all the different frameworks. And so he built the same little client-side application over and over and over again in all the different frameworks. And you were able to watch the video of each one and kind of understand like what it would take to build one. And the interesting thing is like Ember was a two-part video. Angular was a two-part video. Backbone was a two-part <coughs> video. But Meteor was a one-part video. And I found that really interesting because he was able to explain everything in a shorter amount of time. And I'm finding that that is holding in the work that we've done so far. So we're, we're still kind of seeing a 30 to 40% uh, increase in the amount of time we can get something built for, I guess, decrease in time for customers. So who's the, who's the Ryan Bates, so Railscast is part of his, his pro subscription. Um, and so I think the, the interesting pieces here are, you know, there's a lot of, you know, this is an opinionated framework. Um, there are a lot of choices that are already made for you. There are a lot of things that are already hooked up for you. So you kind of get a lot of that uh, magic, as people call it, uh, when you first get started. And you know, I, th I think that's where a lot of the time savings comes from. Um, but the other thing is, you know, the, the packaging system, it's what I wanted Rails engines to always be, um, but never quite ended up being that way. So it's very easy to create little snippets of actual HTML that's backed, you know, reactively, you know, all the database stuff. Like, it's just really easy to integrate. So you can just say, like, MRT add accounts entry, and you get a full, you know, login package with OAuth support and all that kind of stuff out of the box. So um, it, it's definitely great in that way. And then the other thing is, like, they have a lot of great packages as well. So they've got, like, 
account base and account password and all the OAuth stuff that's already built one way and it's very opinionated but already done <laughs> for you so you don't end up with you know 10, 12 different gems that are kind of doing the same thing uh, in, in completely different ways. So um, deployment, I would say it's actually better now than it was when things first started. So uh, you have options like Heroku and Modulus out of the box. They're pretty easy to get started with. Um, you can do a custom build pack with Heroku. Um, Modulus is a local startup. Um, they're more focused on Node.js stuff. And they wrote a package called Demeteorizer, which actually uh, changes the Meteor app to be more of a traditional Node app. And then you can just host it right on their deployment. Um, servers as well and you know you just say modulus deploy and and everything pretty much works there um, the other options are you can use there's a package called meteor up so if you want to run your own servers um, you can just install meteor up and then it'll go out and kind of do chef like stuff and setting up your servers and uh, hooking everything together and, and making sure that it works and then you can just deploy your app um, there's also an interesting thing being developed now called Rocker Docker. Um, I think it's one of a couple Docker-based solutions that people are working on. And it'll be interesting once they come out because I think it'll be very easy for people to just uh, say they want to deploy something with Docker. Just you know, pick, pick the right Docker stack and do a deployment and you're off to the races. So kind of interesting there as well. So I love testing. I, I, I've missed it horribly. This has been one of the things that was kind of the downfall when I came to Meteor. Um, but I think that it's drastically improving it. Um, I guess back in April or May, I started writing a book. And the testing landscape has changed you know, completely in a different direction than where it was early on. So you would do like a uh, an npm install so you'd, you'd say like npm install rtd or Leica, and then they would do all these funky things like you know push stuff into the meteor app and spin it up and like have like eight copies of it and um, run tests against that kind of stuff and it was really bizarre and didn't work very well wasn't great didn't have great documentation um, but since i've been working on the book there's been a an effort that's come together with uh, seven or eight people, and we meet weekly to talk. And um, we've, we've been working on a reactive testing framework, uh, or test runner, I guess, called Velocity. And so um, in, in this screenshot in particular, you can see up in the right corner, there's a, a red dot. And so that's actually the, the test runner telling me that something's failed. And then when I click on it, it expands into this view. So this is all happening in app. And you know you can see that one test passed, one test failed. You can see why. You can actually open open up some logs. You can look in the console and and get all kinds of information about why the test failed. And the interesting thing is that they're they're actually spinning up a mere copy of the Meteor app and then running tests against that. So like it's all self-contained. The database is separate from the development database. So it's been really interesting and fun to watch this reactive testing come about because you know as I'm writing code and hit save my test suites running so it's similar to guard but it's actually happening in the app so I don't have to watch my console I can just go look at this page and see um, but it it also spits out in the console if, if that's your preference so I definitely think there's ways that it can improve um, one of the hardest things has been air handling I think that uh, maybe this is more of a node problem than a media problem specifically. In particular, uh, with the Fantasy Hub, like going back to that example, if we make a call that craps out to the, the API, uh, because we, you know, we're making a call every minute to see if a game's active, and then we're making a call, like once a game's active, we're making a call every 20 seconds to get stats. So. If that crashes in any way, it actually takes down the entire node process. And that just feels wrong to me. And maybe these th two things are kind of tied hand in hand, but the other thing that I miss is how to easily handle asynchronous stuff. Um, I, I don't think, 
you know, we've, we've got this series of, um, I almost want to say like Jerry Rig scaffolding to get the, the jobs running uh, for fetching that game data. We have a set interval that runs every minute and then pushes, you know, once a game goes active, we push it into, we'll push that ID into an array. And then every 20 seconds, we're looking at that array and grabbing data off that using set interval again. I think um, I'd love to see better queuing options. And I think that that would make this much easier. Because if, if the queue ran in its own process, then it would become much easier to not really worry about it taking down the, the node server. So definitely an area that could be improved. Any questions? You mentioned the async and the queuing <coughs> issues. Has Node done, <coughs> is there any work being done on Node to allow it to handle true concurrency or parallelism? Um, you know, I don't know. I haven't really looked at that. So I know that, um, like in particular, Meteor actually uses a uh, fibers package. So it's very similar to Ruby fibers in that regard. So um, they're actually, that's one of the things maybe I should add to the talk. Still in the second thread, though, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, Node is an invented model, right? So I don't, I don't know that you'll see a ton happen there um, right now. I mean, there's still, in the next version, they're going to have promises built in, but it's still going to be kind of the same thing. So, I mean, we're not finding it to be a huge problem. We're handling like 800 to 900 concurrent connections on one kind of node process. So, we haven't found that to be too bad yet. Not that I'm aware of yet. Um, you know, there, there are options for queuing, but nothing, you know, based on an actor model. Um, there are packages like queue. They just don't have great Meteor integration right now. So that's kind of where things fall down. I'm just wondering where most of your production deployments are. Uh, they are on uh, Modulus for the most part. We, we, we pay them far, far too much money. <laughs> I think we're up to like 500 bucks a month in hosting costs. Um, so I tried to get a, a, like an animated GIF of this, but it didn't work out. Um, but as you can see, like, I think I went through here and counted. We've got like 38 apps in here, and probably 30 of them are actually running, and people are hitting the websites. So. Quite a bit deployed. And yes. Yeah. And so um, Heroku is better if you want something free. So Modulus costs 15 bucks a month, um, whereas Heroku is free um, for one dyno. So I've got a couple of things there, like Meteor Talks and Craters there, because I'm cheap. So. Sure. Yeah, I can show that off. It's over here, I think. It's over here. Actually, we can just open the book. Yeah, so like here's one pretty typical, like I've got an episode and I want to take the title and turn it into a slug so that it'll, you know, be nice SEO friendly for the, for the, uh, the Googles. Um, so I just set up a describe block and then, you know, set up an it block and set a title and then pass that title to sl the slugify method and expect it to give me what I want back. So that's that's kind of the unit testing side of things. 
Uh, and then you can kind of see the code here. This is CoffeeScript, which I need to change. Um, yeah, and there's the ugly JavaScript from the CoffeeScript. Um, Right. Oh, your, uh, right. So aspect. there's um, Jasmine unit, there's uh, Jasmine itself, and they're working on uh, server side integration for the Jasmine framework as well. And then there, uh, there's Mocha Web, there's Cucumber JS, there's Nightwatch Selenium. So uh, things are coming along, but it's all still really early with the testing stuff because. Like I wrote a chapter on Cucumber JS about a month and a half ago, and the screenshots are already out of date. And actually, like velocity has changed so much that Cucumber is broken. Like the guy's not maintaining it fast enough, so you know it's gotta it's gotta be fixed. Um, here's a typical. This is more of a what a client side test would look like. So basically, what I'm doing is. Uh, You've got a, like right here on this line, you say that this is test only so it doesn't leak into your production environment. And then I set up my, my um, expectation library, should in this case. And then right here, I'm clearing out the database to make sure there's no users. I create my first user, and then I expect that they're going to be an admin. Uh, huh, I don't know why that didn't wrap. should say should be true there. And then it fails, and then I add some code here that sets, you know, any user to be an admin, and then my test passes. So pretty easy to do red, green, refactor. Yeah. It's probably a tough question because you said most of your client work is already in media, but yeah. how would you talk somebody out of it? I mean, you've seen it running for like a year. How, what, under what circumstances would you tell someone to? Well, I think it's much easier to, to tell Greenfield apps, you know, people coming in and wanting to start something new, like use Meteor, um, which is probably the majority of the people that come in. Um, we haven't really found a case where we'd tell someone to, to stay away from it. I would say, like, right now the server side rendering piece is missing, so doing things like caching is a little hard. Um, you can do interesting things to make it work, but it's just not officially supported yet. So I would say someone that's expecting some traffic pattern similar to like a blog or a news website or something like that, where there's going to be a lot of people coming in and looking at the same content over and over again, like I, I would probably steer someone away from that right now, uh, unless it's going to be reactive in some way. So that would be the, the case. Um, so out of curiosity, when you started working with it, what sort of things Um, yeah, I would say, like, seriously, like, the, the server-side rendering piece is probably the biggest at this point. Um, I don't really remember, I mean, there were instances, like, they've fixed, so they have Blaze, which they've actually ripped out to be its own package at this point. Um, so you can use Blaze.js if you just want, like, the client-side reactivity stuff. Um, so they've... They took out, they used to have something else there. Uh, they were using handlebars and uh, I think they called it Spark maybe. And um, they, they took that out and rewrote Blaze to be a, a new thing. And the, the problem with Spark was the fact that the way it was kind of doing the reactivity, it would actually re-render an entire template even if just one piece had changed in that template. And so you're starting to get weird things like uh, in particular, I built a page that had like a, a sidebar popped out, but the default view for the sidebar was to be display none. And so every time that template would update, like the bar would go away. Yeah. And so there was no way for me to like keep that bar open because I was updating like a progress bar in it. So it was, uh, it was kind of annoying. But nowadays, like that's all kind of gone away. So I would say the reactivity part has gotten 50% better. I don't know. <laughs> 
little bit more. So Blaze.js is a replacement for something like Ember or Angular on the front end. Is that? Um, it'd probably be close to that. What would you talk to on the back end? What would you talk to on the back end? Yeah, so it's sort of a, that's two part, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I actually haven't looked at Blaze. Um, yeah, I would say this is probably closer to React than anything else. So it would be kind of a replacement for that. Um, hmm? Uh, no, no. So they, they use, uh, they've got their own version of handlebars called space bars that they use. Um, but the people have already made compatible template replacements. So there's Jade and, you know, some other standard ones have already been built and, and dropped in place. So that was that was actually a goal of um, Blaze and, and Spacebars was to, to make it easier for people to add more templating languages. And what was the second part of your question? And so uh, Meteor by default uses DDP to communicate from the front end to the back end. Um, is, does Blaze use, is Blaze using DDP or is, how does it communicate? No. Um, with Blaze being its own thing now, you, you would actually just, they've, they still have like Depths Auto Run, which is doing those calculations, but you just put the data there and it'll watch that data and update it when you want. Okay, so, so literally just doing the front end of like, hey, I want to respond to this data changing. Right. That's what Blaze provides, because you'd have to write all the stuff yourself to actually get data from the server or whatever. Yeah. So all the media guys kind of look at Blaze being its own thing and go like, why would you do that? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. Right. So, I mean, yeah, why would you do that? Yeah. Because you've got a whole bunch of yeah. legacy stuff on the back end. Or yeah, so I, I think the other interesting thing here is that uh, there are a number of people that have built DDP servers and clients. So you could easily um, publish DDP data from a Ruby app or from a Java app. So... Uh, I think that's kind of an interesting way to perhaps get Meteor into something. Like maybe you have an existing infrastructure, you just expose DDP. Like in particular, a good example would be Objective DDP, which is a client-side um, iOS library. And you're able to just make the subscriptions to the server, and then any time that data would change, it's just coming right down into the iOS app. And so you're able to like get that live updating without having to do any kind of like Ajax calls or anything crazy like that. So how is DDP different from WebSockets? Uh, so, well, WebSockets is established between the client and the server, and DDP is actually the, the wire transfer protocol, and that's how the data is going over WebSockets. So they're using, I think they call it eJSON, and they're uh, describing the data as it's going back and forth on the wire using DDP, so. Sure. I don't know if you're up on the history of this uh, framework or just yeah. use it, but do you happen to know what itch it scratched for community creators? Like, uh, yes. Or whatever? Yeah, yeah, I do actually. So the initial um, version of it came, they were a Y Combinator back company. I guess they still are. Um, so they were in like one of the Y Combinator classes like 11 or 12 somewhere around there and they were building like a travel website but they wanted to be highly reactive as as data was updating and so they started building the framework and they actually became more interested in the framework itself than they did the idea and so they kind of shifted about two weeks before demo day and uh, it was originally called uh, I think Skybreak and they demoed Skybreak at the Y Combinator demo day. And um, somehow they came across a guy that owned Meteor.com. And he was willing, he was really excited about the idea and sold them the domain for stupid cheap, like a couple grand, I think. And so they, they renamed it to Meteor. Um, but yeah, I think the real thing was just they built the framework because they wanted a real time kind of website as part of their. They're getting started in Y Combinator, and there was nothing good around at the time, so that, that's where it came from. Sure. Uh, that's like a protocol. What would be like between websites and DDP? 
What web sockets versus DVP? What's the difference? So you're actually using web sockets and DDP together. So web sockets establishes the connection between the client and server, and then DDP is just taking the data um, from the server or from the client and turning it into a protocol that'll allow it to go over the web sockets connection. Uh, you know, honestly, like, that's probably not something that I've dug into a lot. That That's an interesting question. Um, well, JSON wasn't invented there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Which is, which is true. Like, if you look at some of the stuff that comes out of, like, Closure Script and stuff, they do the exact same thing. They're like, well, why are we sending JSON when we can just send Closure data? Right. So they make up their own formats because it's like, hey, if I'm going to use the same language, I think the big thing for them was just not having enough formats in JSON. So that was kind of where EJSON came about. And you're able to, I think you're able to add your own EJSON format. So if you wanted to, to get down in there and, and add one for a particular need, you could. I've seen people do some really interesting things. So I know there is uh, an app that uh, some postgraduate college students have been building and they have like an electron microscope and they've built their own EJSON format and they've implemented a DDP um, client and they're pushing that data from the microscope to the Meteor app and so you're able to kind of use the Meteor app to control that microscope and see the results. Structure the JSON. You can inject your own formatting system into it. Can you? I mean, what's the what's stuff you can do in there? Uh, you could, but I. It's not necessarily like valid JSON at that point, right? And so I think the idea of eJSON is that you're well, able I mean, to. You just have a string saying this is like something that says uh, format is, and then the next bit be the. the I, I mean. I would say yeah, you could, but at the same time, like you could probably just go use like. Um, Angular and you know Node and something else and, and write your own structures as well. I mean, I think the the big thing here is that they're trying to create some semblance of standards to make things easier for people. Yeah, so it just does uh, AJAX pulling at that point. And you can actually see um, right here in these logs where it's actually making <laughs> this HXR is a, a pulling request where someone didn't have WebSockets working. So. Um, yeah, so th there was actually a good article just posted on Crater where they were doing kind of the, the Twitter, like, new incoming document pattern, where it says, like, you know, you have one new tweet kind of thing. And so he, he walks through that, and you can see here, like, the feed helpers, he's got the feed and then the incoming, and basically... He's just tracking a feed populated at session variable, and uh, if it's before that, then you know it won't. It'll 
it'll show if it's after that then it won't show but it'll show you like you have one new tweet waiting or something like that um, Would this be client side? yeah this is all client side script here <coughs> Well, I think that, so the data is still sent. It's just not going to show until it's ready. So I guess that doesn't quite answer your question. I think there's no easy way right now that I know of to stop data from sending or to batch it up. Like, it just happens. Like, it's just sending as it's happening. Your question wasn't, what if you can't send the data? That's, is that, like, if you're on a mobile device and you don't have connectivity, like, does it just not... Well, so there's there's other interesting concepts in here that I haven't touched on. So you have um, <coughs> latency compensation. So uh, anything that's happening client side is actually happening um, in your client, and then the changes are pushed to the server. And so you can actually say like, make it look like this change happened, and then eventually it'll get pushed to the server. And if the server rejects it, then it'll fall out and undo the the change that you saw. So that's um certainly bringing up new kind of design patterns, like what's the best way to handle a rejected change. Uh, that's something that I think a lot of people are thinking through right now. The, um, the other interesting thing too is like, you know, you can use local storage as well. So you could, you could push a lot of data into local storage and then do syncing if you want, if that's a thing that you're worried about. Um, so I think step one is obviously like they're putting Cordova into the build tool and you'll be able to say like, you know, Meteor build iOS and that'll give you like a hybrid app, right? So it's still going to be based on, excuse me, the HTML that's being served up. So it'll make a connection and pull the HTML over. Excuse me. Um, I don't know that, I don't know, like you're, just going to have to wait and kind of watch and see if people do interesting things. I have a feeling like a lot of people will start pushing that once the Cordova integration comes out, like wanting a way to do the kind of offline data stuff and then sync when you come back online type of thing. Yeah. We're sort of getting into, I mean, this is, I guess, by definition, like client server programming. and things like that and the patterns that we use to deal with sort of the complexity and the problems that we run into with distributed systems and things. And so um, I was just thinking of things like the you know circuit breaker patterns and stuff like that that you see when you're trying to talk to other systems and they're failing, you continue to call them and stuff. Um, have they figured any of that stuff out and on the client side? To they've, um, they've started to work on stuff like that. So they have... Um, like if you need to make API requests somewhere, they have an HTTP library that you can use and it's got like exponential back off and that kind of thing in it. So yeah, I think they're thinking about it, but it's probably not a huge priority. Honestly, like the big priority right now is um, with Atmosphere, um, that this was an entire packaging system built outside of Meteor Development Group. So. Um, they're working to get first level integration. So you'll just be able to say like Meteor add and you'll get the package that you want instead of MRT add. Um, and that's their big focus right now. They're, uh, they're on 0 0.9, I think release candidate six or seven. Um, and that's what they're trying to get done as the, the last major piece before 1.0 comes out. Uh, right now, there is a package that was built by Media Development Group that um, works with Redis. I think there are a couple other um, packages as well. Yeah, you can see here, Mini Redis, I think, is the one that they did. Um, and then this is Redis Live Data. So that's kind of like the two pieces that you need to get the reactive data store to work on the client side. Um, so they've officially hired someone and their first act since joining the team was to get Redis kind of proof of concept done and see if it was interesting and how it worked and how long it took and that kind of thing. Um, and now 
their major focus for him is going to be uh, Postgres support. So that's going to be the next big thing that you see. It'll probably be part of like 1.1 or something along those lines, 1.2. Um, and then their, their other major focus is they're building their own hosting environment as well. It's going to be similar to Heroku maybe. And um, they're, they're hoping that that's going to be their money play, like their, their um, they're going to go after enterprise hosting. Yeah. Earn back their 11 million plus. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say your, what was your ex before you came here? Was it Rails primary? Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I've been doing Rails since 2004. Um, and I guess, I guess when I started here, I started doing Backbone at Gaslight uh, and did that for like a year and a half. And then, uh, got back out of doing JavaScript stuff and just back to doing like backend server scaling stuff for GoDaddy, and then uh, and then ended up going to Differential and convinced them to do Meteor full time. So. Not too difficult. Like missing the testing was a big one. Um, just feels too cowboyish without the testing frameworks around. Um, and you know, when you get to, I think building something in six weeks isn't too bad without a testing framework, but we've had a couple clients come back and really start to push the app. And I think click testing starts to fail somewhere around, you know, week seven, week eight, like there's just too much in the app to test by hand. So that's probably the hardest thing that I've found. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think so. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the docs are, the docs are really great. Um, I think they could, I don't know, I plan to write a blog post or something on this because people never notice, but over here in the side, you kind of get this anywhere or, um, server or client. And so it kind of tells you like where these calls are available. Um, a lot of people don't notice that, and that might be confusing at first because certain environments only have certain components kind of built into them. So I can only call publish on the server side, and I can only call subscribe on the client side. I would say uh, probably using session variables too much. Um, I think there's a, a time and a place for it, but it's a it feels like a crutch to um, just throw everything in a session variable. And the problem is that uh, it's not the same as like a Rails session. It's actually just um, temporary storage while that connection's open. So if someone hard refreshes the page, that session data goes away. So you really have to, to be careful. Um, and there's also, you can install a package um, called Session Amplify, which is used to amplify JS to do local storage. So whenever you save a session variable, it'll actually save to their local storage. Um, but then, I mean, you just have to worry about clearing those variables out every time you use them. So you just, like, it's just something that you should be careful with, I guess. It's, it's a place that we've noticed that we, we end up using it and then end up ripping it out because there's a better way to do it. Meteor app that you've worked on, and like, have you had to maintain them over like multiple releases and stuff like that? And yes. So actually, it's Sorry one in there. one one in the same on that that particular question. So it was Fantasy Hub. Um, we did the initial engagement. I think was ten weeks with them, and they wanted to build out the you know live fantasy sports platform, and we built. We built it out in about nine weeks, and then we took a break for a little while, and then they came back, and. Um, they came back for another like 10 or 12 weeks and I would say like you know that's as long term as we've gone with a client up to this point um, we've replaced ourselves uh, we helped them hire some interns who knew JavaScript well enough and kind of picked up Meteor and, and ran with it and they've continued to push the platform so you know we we set up uh, basketball and baseball and um, like the APIs are all slightly different for each sport. 
um, but they've gone in now and they've set up, I think, football and hockey as well. The, the interns have. So I would say like long-term maintainability seems pretty good so far, but I, I would be curious to kind of go back and ask them like how they're feeling about it at this point. value or the lack of value in getting started quickly mm -hmm. and uh, versus the value of how productive you are later on in week 75 or yeah <laughs> even week 25 or whatever you yeah know. year five yeah year five year, year three whatever is some in in greater than yeah but i mean i i've i've touched five-year-old rails apps and it's really hard to be productive there too so yeah, I, I'm not rails yeah so yeah I would say that's a lot of discipline and, you know, just best practices to do a good job there. And I'm not sure, like, Meteor is going to be good or bad at, at that in particular. Um, I would say the one thing that I've noticed is there's a lack of official app structure from Meteor. And so that's, like, I just picked up an app that someone else half built and the client came to us and said, like, can you finish it? And uh, they didn't follow any rhyme or reason to how they structured like where their files are or how their files are named and that's been kind of painful like we've developed standards at differential and we follow those so it's been it's been kind of like frustrating <laughs> but i mean it's you know with this just being client side it's like the rails pipeline like it just gloms everything together and sends it down and you really don't unlike rails pipeline you don't have much control over how things are ordered or when they get sent or any of that kind of stuff so um, but that'll change in in 1.0 they're going to have a file where you can specify load ordering and that kind of thing so so there's no rhyme or reason how it sends it down uh it's actually alphabetical it's alphabetical by deepest folders deepest first. yeah deepest folder first and then that's like done alphabetically and then Inside the folders, the, the libraries are alphabetical too. Z underscore name. <laughs> you end up with like, I honestly, I've only ever run into it once as an actual problem. But the more you try to integrate jQuery plugins and libraries that depend on each other, the more you might kind of run into that. Do you find yourself writing the, uh, your Meteor in JavaScript or CoffeeScript? And is it a personal preference or does one of the two fit the style? And the features of the framework better? So differential is mostly CoffeeScript, like 95% CoffeeScript. Um, but I, I do find there's like a general distaste in the community for like packages that are written in CoffeeScript. A lot of people will be like, I'm not going to contribute. I don't know CoffeeScript. I'm not even going to bother to learn. So, you know, just fix your package or I'm not going to use it. Um, so that's been interesting and different. Uh, and then like I, I accidentally included a line of, of CoffeeScript in the testing book. And like a guy sent me a pretty angry email about that too. So um, I, I would say, yeah, it is definitely personal preference. Um, you know, the, the project I just took over was all on CoffeeScript. Um, but, you know, we've taken over one that was in JavaScript as well. So I don't know. Like I don't, at this point, I've written enough packages in pure JavaScript that I feel comfortable there. And, you know, I don't, I don't mind switching back and forth. I, I do miss some of the niceties of CoffeeScript. So, sure. So, I know when I've been doing Django stuff in the past, I'm going to use a certain jQuery plugin. Sometimes you can very get over to get friendly with the way the Angular work is a pain. Do you see the same sort of problems in Meteor? Absolutely, that used to be a problem. Yeah. Um, it's not anymore. Since they, so with Spark, you know, it was really a, a big problem. And then when they redid Blaze, one of their goals was to have like, 100% jQuery plugin compatibility if they could. And so they worked really hard on that kind of stuff. And now you can just drop it in and, and, and most of the time those plugins just work. Um, the biggest thing is sometimes you'll have to like, uh, when a template gets rendered, you get a rendered callback and um, you can usually hook in a lot of your jQuery stuff right there. So, so another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's the meteorite, uh, and then they're replacing that. So I can say like, MRT add accounts. So I can say uh, MRT add accounts Facebook. Let's just run this so you guys can kind of see it. 
So this is a little podcast app I wrote as a, a demo. Yeah, smart.lock. There's a smart.json and a smart.lock file. And, and that has, you can actually see, this is it right here. So it, it just pulls from like GitHub or wherever you, you, you have things at. And they use just the tagging and a Git repo. And uh, they'll grab the SHA. And they, they actually do some interesting things under the covers. They, um, they check it out into a Meteorite folder in your home directory. And then they'll go find the version that's in the smart.lock, this uh, SHA hash right here. And they'll link that in to the Meteor app, and it gets shoved into the kind of the packages system as as it's building the. Is that using yeah. NPM or is that its own thing? Uh, it's its own thing, but it has npm integration, so you can say like npm depend, and then give it a name, and it'll pull that in. And so if I just say like mrt add accounts Facebook, and we go to the sign up page. <clears throat> You can see in the background it added Facebook, and then this page should refresh, and now we get the configure Facebook login button. And then if I put in my API keys here, I can start logging in using Facebook at that point. So it is like magic. All right. Yeah.